again. I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to welcome to um, the Arrington Research Forum Georgina Bourne and Owen Green. And Professor Georgina Bourne is based currently at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the De Department of Anthropo uh, Anthropology at the University College London. And Owen Green is in the Department of Music at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite them up to speak about Mud AI, Music and AI Building Critical Interdisciplinary Studies. Thanks, thanks very much. Is this working? Yeah. A slight effect. Got it. Good. So um, thanks for inviting us, Emily, and it's nice to be here. Um, and I'm going to begin for about 10 minutes, and then the vast majority of the time will be presented by Owen, in, in, and you'll see why. Um, I also want to mention that... Um, we are in the middle of giving a series of four seminars in collaboration with the Alan Turing Institute in London on our work. Uh, we've held the first uh, on January the 12th at the Turing Institute in London. Yesterday, we were up in Edinburgh and gave the second on issues of AI and copyright. And in, I don't know, two weeks time-ish, we're going to be back here at the RNCM to present our third in the series. Uh, so please come along, and that will be two composers with whom we've been working, Artemi Maria Giotti and Erin Einbond, and they will be talking about the projects they've done in the program uh, and indeed presenting film of performances of their works, which are both using AI in very different ways, um, informed by uh, theory and critical theory from the humanities, which is the kind of particular task they were given. So please do come along. And the fourth uh, seminar will be back again at the Alan Turing Institute in London, and is kind of the final uh, stage of our work, which is translating, uh, I'll come on to that in a minute. So here today, we're going to do two things. I'm going to introduce the broader research program, this thing called MUSAI, which is the awful acronym uh, for uh, this uh, uh, larger title, which is Music and AI, Building Critical Interdisciplinary Studies. And I'm gonna talk about that for about 10 minutes, what this research program's about. And then Owen will carry on, and he'll be talking about one project of ours within this umbrella, uh, which is very much in, in the middle, uh, barely a year in, eight, nine months in. Um, and uh, so it's work in progress, and uh, it's about musical genre. And um, you'll hear a lot more about that. So here is the website of the Music and AI, Mas AI, research program. Do take a look, please. It's on WordPress. There's the URL. And uh, that's a snap from a rehearsal of uh, Artemi Maria Giotti's piece, Bias Two. The pianist, uh, Zenia Pestova, and that's Artemi at her laptop. You can barely see her. Um, so you'll hear about that when we come back. Um, the Mazai project, a uh, program, I'm going to call it, um, is a five-year research program. This is from the website. Um, and it's investigating the cultural implications of AI through a series of critical studies examining its relationship with music. So we take music as a lens, a particularly interesting and important lens, onto wider questions of the way uh, AI is implicated in the transformation of culture more generally. And uh, the MAS AI project is funded by the advanced grant scheme of the European Research Council, the ERC. Um, and it had, has been very, you know, we've been the beneficiary of additional funding from a number of other bodies, uh, among them the Max Planck Institute for <coughs> Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt, Germany. 
uh, and money from McGill University, Myler, which is the Quebec AI Institute, um, and a few others too. Uh, I'm the PI, the principal investigator, and the project, the program as a whole is based at UCL, where I'm a prof uh, in the Institute of Advanced Studies with uh, a second position in the Department of Anthropology. Um, so here uh, on the right is a list of the 10 projects that compose together the larger Maze AI research program. And um, uh, I'm going to, uh, the, the blue one at the top is the one that Owen will present to today called Sonic Social Genre uh, Towards Multimodal Computational Music Genre Modeling. Um, and then there is a series of other ones. We've just had a couple of hours in the PRISM uh, main room, and we've been talking about some of this work. Um, uh, and uh, I won't go through it all now, but I'll give you a flavor of what we're doing. And these, th th there are some images from the website. So um, two, the next two in the list there, uh, Cultural Economies of Ad Adaptive and Affective Music AI and Commercial Generative Music, uh, led by Eric Drott and Oliver Baum, are two, if you like, quite close up, um, part historical, past, part ethnographic and interview-based studies of um, the startup sector uh, uh, in music AI, which is where a lot of the kind of cutting edge breaking research is happening. <coughs> and we're very interested in that work and we're looking at uh, uh, the, the form it takes, the kind of economy being generated, um, the kinds of uh, research and initiatives that are being uh, fomented in this area. And we talked about some of this earlier. So it's a very uh, important set of insights into, if you like, the sort of uh, commercial uh, economy being very rapidly generated around AI in relation to music. Um, the third project by Chris Howarth, uh, Critical Interdisciplinarity, is looking through three case studies, historical and now, um, of musician-engineer collaborations in developing AI in different eras um, I'm going to probably forget this. I think we begin with, yeah, we do, with um, uh, Marvin Minsky and Marianne Amache way back in the 60s at the MIT, uh, I think it was already then the Media Lab, um, and this collaboration between Amache and Minsky was pretty important. Uh, and Chris is looking at that. Then he's fast forwarding to David Tudor, working with two engineers. I'm gonna forget the machine. Um, at, 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 uh, I think we're talking now uh, about the uh, 80s. Uh, and then right up to the present, he's looking at Holly Herndon in her work um, with uh, the engineer Jules Spawn. Uh, Jules, mm, I'm gonna forget his Laplace. Um, La Forgive me, I haven't genned up on this. Um, so it's a kind of comparative study of the changing relationships that have been formed and what they've uh, allowed musicians to do um, over, over these three case studies. Um, Jonathan Stern looking at the automation of um, mastering. Uh, in his work, um, uh, permeable interdisciplinarity is uh, the project that Aaron and Artemy Maria are going to present in two weeks here. They both did quite independent compositional projects um, using AI, but uh, informed by uh, uh, theories and ideas from the critical humanities in their work. Um, then we have two ethnographic studies, both of them outside the West, which we very much wanted to do. Darcy Sprengel, both, both ethnomusicologists who have already worked a great deal in these areas. Darcy Sprengel, who's based at King's College London, is looking at um, attempts to localize recommendation and streaming in the Middle East uh, through the platform Anhami, which uh, purports to be adapting 
streaming and recommendation for Middle Eastern and Arabic audiences and markets, introducing cultural difference and locality. Um, Yana Ser is looking at the Nigerian music scene and at the kind of virality um, of the way that this whole economy around AI is taking off from the ground up. Um, and then uh, the final kind of research of this first phase has been our work on recommendation systems, which I introduced in the last couple of hours. Um, and there, the premise is that we are interested in rethinking recommendation as a paradigm that's uh, very dominant now, and in particular, its links to personalization. Um, and I won't go into that more, but we discussed it in the last couple of hours. All of that research, we're then going to take a deep breath this summer and this autumn and come together in kind of uh, thinking workshops. And we're going to um, adduce uh, some critical results from our work that we think will be valuable in introducing into new trainings for AI graduate students, um, both in the arts and music and in general. And we're going to prototype a new kind of training that introduces some critical uh, perspectives and thinking from uh, on the base of our work. Uh, and that will be led by Rebecca Fiebrink, who's a colleague who runs the uh, Institute for Computational Creativity at the University of the Arts London and is very seasoned in training art students in AI. Uh, and so she's uh, going to be leading on that uh, with me. Uh, and the premise for that phase of our work is that uh, as of maybe three, four, five years ago, there was a wave of concern across the world, uh, you know, long predating the recent uh, wave of anxiety around AI. Um, and uh, from Arizona State University to the University of New South Wales to King's College London, a whole series of universities with strong engineering and computer science departments um, made it known that they thought it was time to change how computer scientists are being trained, particularly around AI, in order to equip them better to enter this area uh, uh, able to make um, judgments uh, towards uh, social and cultural benefits for mankind, for humankind. And so I was writing this uh, research proposal at the time, and I thought, well, hey, we'll contribute to that. We're going to be developing new kinds of interdisciplinarity, so we'll add our voice to this call for new kinds of trainings. And if I were to put it in a nutshell, it would be to say to you all, which we can talk about later, I hope, uh, that ethics isn't enough. Okay, the current kind of answer, in quotes, to the problems of the risks associated with AI is to introduce a dash of ethics into the training of students in this area. And I think that's quite insufficient, and that actually what we need to do is equip them with a series of kind of perspectives of the kind we're working on here, uh, so that they themselves have a greater interdisciplinarity in their, um, the, uh, I, you know, in, in the way they work, um, and they can themselves be attuned to the potential risks, benefits, and powers of this extraordinary technology. So that's what we're going to do in the second stage. So why this program? Um, it's very simple. Um, you know, despite a growing academic and po policy work, as I've mentioned, on the social and ethical implications of AI, uh, when I wrote this thing, and I think it's still the case, no major research initiative had as yet examined AI's cultural implications, which, as you all know, I think music as the medium through which to build, to initiate a field of critical interdisciplinary studies examining AI's implications for culture. And uh, if you're in this area at all, you'll probably know that actually quite a lot of money is going to practice-oriented artistic and music research in this area. I'll give an example. In London, Queen Mary 
University has a center for digital music and they obtain many grants in this area, specifically oriented to music composition and engineering approaches to AI. Um, but critical research uh, is at a much, uh, ha has been much less funded. It's at an early stage. And uh, by the way, critical perspectives are not uh, a, a, a merely negative intervention here because as I hope we'll show you uh, in today and in two weeks time, critical perspectives can seed um, new approaches not only to AI design, uh, but also to music making and to composition. Um, and to do these things, uh, so our work uh, proposes, we need new approaches that cut across entrenched disciplinary, methodological, and epistemological divisions. And you're going to hear a bit about this from Owen in a, in a minute. Um, and so to exemplify that grand claim, one of the things we've done with the money, which is wonderful, uh, the ERC, as you may or may not know, gives five years of funding at a scale, which means you can do uh, what I'm about to describe. And that is sustained, rich, deep, interdisciplinary dialogues between, on the one hand, computer scientists, engineers, people in music information retrieval, data science for music, and on the other hand, people coming from the arts, composition, social sciences like myself, humanities, and so on. So only with this scale of funding, uh, I mean, in academia, can we sustain and nurture these kind of deep, sustained interdisciplinary dialogues. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, and in two projects in particular, the one on recommendation, where for two years um, I've been in dialogue with computer scientists and we've developed a new approach to recommendation, which I described earlier this afternoon. Um, and in the project that Owen will describe, we're looking at musical genre and we're in deep dialogue with a leading figure from music information retrieval. So these are the two um, key projects kind of plowing this new interdisciplinarity um, over, you know, over a sustained period. And our aim in doing that is not only to do specific research projects, which are definitely what we are, uh, you know, is a priority, but we also want to prototype um, new kinds of radical interdisciplinarity for AI music and for the digital humanities. That again comes to the genre project. Um, and you know, it would surprise you to know how rare this kind of sustained interdisciplinarity is. I think PRISM is trying to do this kind of thing too, which is it's nice that you've got your core funding that, you know, allows you to do that. Um, so uh, that's uh, something about the program as a whole. Here's a smattering of the outputs that we have uh, come up with so far. There are performances, of course, seminars, conference presentations, the odd book. Um, yeah, and uh, I wonder, you know, should we take questions on that now or just move straight on, I suppose? Uh, I'm happy to move straight on. Yeah, let, 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 let's do that, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna hand over with no more delay to, uh, to Owen. So whilst the projector um, sorts itself out, um, I'm going to try and cover a sort of talk in the three and a bit parts. Um, I think quite quite swiftly. I don't want to bog us down, and I want to leave some space at the end um, for people to tell me that I'm wrong or deluded. Um, I know there's people in the room who work at the kind of intersection of music and science, and um, as we'll see um, when I sort of describe some of the work in progress, it's very much one of the core questions here is sort of methodological and epistemological um, and how some of these ideas that are uh, sort of gestating might translate to other, to other questions. 
Um, so alongside uh, Georgie and I um, <coughs> on this project, um, my uh, supervisor at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics, Noli von Schulman, um, and Bob Sturm, who I think is familiar to at least some people at RNCM, um, who's at um, KTH in Stockholm. Um, I'm just back from a week with Bob in Stockholm, and one of the things I'll describe um, is a, th a thread of work we're doing about um, the genre in music information retrieval. Um, so the background to the Sonic Social Genre project really comes out of critical work that Bob's um, been doing for about the last 12 years or so about the states of music information retrieval in general and uh, genre recognition systems as a kind of particular um, embodiment of some of the problems um, that he's been coming um, to do. And I think when him and Georgina and Melanie got together, sort of some core questions that came up were, was that there's no real theory of genre in this work. Um, and alongside that are these more scientific and computational problems <coughs> that Bob's been writing about to do with sort of evaluation practices and um, how one interprets these models. Um, and then, <coughs> um, as we see, there's a kind of paradigm there of most of this work being based on predictive modeling, um, which if you're doing the kinds of investigations of genre that humanists and social scientists might be doing, isn't actually terribly interesting. You want more of an, ex an explanatory um, kind of approach to modeling, which requires rethinking um, a little bit. Um, and the idea is to proceed through some case studies and think about how some of this richer theory that comes from the social sciences and humanities can be um, introduced, how we can build in um, the integration of more diverse kinds of data than just the sort of audio data that a lot of these systems um, rely upon. And the, the aims are around sort of methodological and epistemological um, innovation. So we're less concerned with coming out with shiny new results about genre recognition um, than we are about thinking about um, how, how we go about doing this and what kind of knowledge claims um, we can make. Um, and this is sort of from the project text um, to sort of give you an indication of the kind of interdisciplinarity um, that, that we're pursuing here. And if you're familiar with Georgina's sort of previous work on interdisciplinarity, you'll sort of recall that you know, <coughs> one of the noble goals can be to actually arrive at a a shared transformation of, of your understanding of the objects of study. Um, so it's not just kind of a subscription of subservience model where we're using each other's stuff, but to actually enable new ways of thinking about the, um, about the domain. So uh, what I'm going to do now is qu kind of quickly run through what I'm doing with Bob. I don't want to spend too much time on it, um, but there are some bar charts, so it makes us look like we've done some stuff, right? Um, <coughs> so... Um, what happens at the moment in sort of music informatics genre recognition research is the standard machine learning model, which I'm sure a lot of the people in this room are familiar with and actually do. Um, you start off with some data and you kind of mill it through this black box and some stuff comes out at the other end um, and you declare success on the basis of um, how your answer sort of measure, measures up against some kind of benchmark. Um, now Bob's... Um, long history of criticising some of this work. It's touched on quite a few things. Um, there's a sort of list of publications <coughs> um, showing how long he's been at this. Um, and at the bottom there, this paper from last year is quite interesting because he's really getting into thinking quite deeply about experimental design, um, sort of coming particularly from uh <coughs> the hard sciences and sort of, uh, psychology and seeing how well some of this sort of music informatics um, research stacks up against, um, against these criteria uh, for, for validity. Um, and he did a survey paper, um, the sort of big representation of which was in the Journal of New Music Research about um, 10 years ago. Um, and he read 475 papers um, going up to 2012, we found that there's these problems with the data set. So the GTZAN data set has these really serious problems. There's repetitions, there's mislabeled data, there's distorted data. Um, 
there's problems with the figures of merit. So you know, if you're just using uh, classification accuracy, that's like how, how often your machine is right, that doesn't give you enough information to actually make any serious statement about whether or not the machine is doing what you think it's doing. Um, and Bob has a variety of wonderful tricks um, for upsetting these machines um, and showing that whatever it is that they've learned is nothing to do with human hearing. So you can sort of show that this machine has um, <coughs> learned to distinguish between two notional genres on the basis of sounds that we can't hear, for example. Um, and there's very little discussion in the field about experimental design at all. Like you do a classification experiment, like can you tell the difference between A and B, and you, and you move on. Um, and very, very little consideration of that is either a task that maps onto how human beings um, think about genre or something that we need, um, or even if it's the most interesting question that could be asked. Um, so Bob and I are revisiting um, this whole exercise to see if anything's changed. So now we have read <laughs> uh, another 500 odd papers from 2013 um, up to 2022 to see if um, sort of anyone's listened and changed their ways. Um, who's actually doing this research now and why are they doing it still? Um, so we've re sort of recorded what data sets are being used, the figures of merit, the experimental designs, which is what Bob did in the first place. Um, but we're also looking for whether people have cited his work, and more importantly, whether they've engaged with it or understood it. Um, and <coughs> also, for any indications that authors in this field are reaching out to studies of genre from outside music informatics, like if they're looking at any of the sort of existing anthropological or sociological work, um, and again, whether they've engaged with it or just kind of dropped a citation in. And also to get a feel for what's motivating people to do to do this stuff, like, um, we've sort of whizzed through some, some findings now. Um, if we ignore that dip around 2013-14, which is just because we haven't actually finished the data entry yet, uh, one day we will, um, whereas before the kind of rate of publication was, was soaring, it seems to have kind of notionally leveled off, that slightly more than a paper a week comes out with a, a new mu music genre recognition system. Um, remarkably, nobody has really paid any attention to the problems that Bob found with the GT then um, data set. It's still by far um, the most used one. Um, moreover, most of the people using it have paid no attention at all to the problems that Bob, Bob found. He did give quite detailed instructions on how to use it meaningfully. Zilch, like I think <coughs> 35 people referred to it, even fewer actually followed advice about partitioning and what have you. People are still mostly using classification accuracy and, noth and nothing else. Um, this <coughs> um, we don't really need to get into what all these different measures do, except to say that if you're going to do this work, you actually need to take a range of them, think about what they're telling you and where they might agree, but also then start re-interrogating the system. Right? You don't just report the number and move on. You think about it and try and find out why it's getting the things wrong that it's getting wrong. And there's very little of that. Um, <coughs> questions that we will go on to ask, we're going to try and develop an Izmir paper um, around this, is that there seems to be an increase in people doing some genre recognition, recognition experiments outside of Western popular music, which has been the kind of dominant paradigm up to now. Um, and it's quite interesting to sort of think through that. Who's doing it? Where, where are they doing it? Like where are they publishing, but also where are they doing the research? Um, where are they getting the data? Um, and are there sort of some gatekeeping effects? So one of the things that we've noticed is that perhaps some of this stuff has moved out of, of Izmir, which is the big music informatics uh, conference, and it's an appearing in more generic sort of computer science conferences and journals. Is that because people are just doing vanity publications? Um, or are there sort of gatekeeping effects where people aren't getting into Izmir with work um, that doesn't seem technologically novel enough or something, even though they're looking at some, some different data? Um, and that will require some, deep, some deeper reading. Likewise, to follow up on some citation patterns, are there some sort of bubbles forming of you know, <coughs> stuff that's only happening in India and isn't sort of, um, talking to other people? Again, we're going to have to look 
um, more closely. And finally, to ask what more meaningful work would look like here. Like, again, to consider this idea of the task and how it actually maps to what people might need to do with genre. A lot of the time, these papers are justified in terms of there being a terrible problem with too much music in the world, and we urgently need to sort through it. Um, but no real indication that commercial services like Spotify or Deezer are relying on this kind of work. They sort of tend to rely more on behavioral data than they do on audio data. So that was a, a whistle-stop tour. Part two is what does a more adequate theory of genre look like? So this is going to be a very condensed account of theoretical work uh, that Georgina and David Brackett in particular um, have sort of developed over, God, nearly 20 years now. Um, and there's sort of some key references down there that I'll, I'll leave up for um, a few seconds so people can um, digest them. Um, but really key to this is to get beyond essentializing genres as just being um, reducible to sort of st sonic stylistic differences between forms of music, um, or the obverse, to reduce them just to sort of social difference, and to try and think about how, how these things actually interrelate and move about in quite complex ways. So here starts the whistle-stop tour of this theory. Um, genres are, are mediated. So Georgina has written an awful lot about mediation in music and sort of building on uh, theories from people like Hennion and what have you. So we've got things like the social in there, we've got the sonic in there, but you've got the way that music is mediated through um, discourse of critics and commentators, you've got the institutions and, and what have you. Um, and for any particular genre, this kind of network of relationships is quite liable to be different, right? Um, <coughs> furthermore, hey, it worked. Um, <laughs> um, <coughs> genres, well, sorry, it's the point I just said. Different genres have different networks. Um, and, and there we go. Furthermore, individual genres are actually dynamic. So these networks for any given indiv individual for, uh, genre formation are going to change over time. So studying an individual genre is partly a matter of tracing diachronically what's going on in this kind of shifting uh, network of, of mediations. Moreover, genres are primarily um, defined in relation to each other. We, we understand genres partly by what they're not um, or partly by what they evoke. So I've tried with these sort of various different lines here to sort of illustrate different kinds of relationships that genres have, none of which should be too surprising to you, that we've got something which might look like the sense with that downward um, blue arrow, something which might look like kind of antagonism with that red arrow with the, uh, with the stop sign in the middle, um, or some kind of exchange going on at the top um, and with that dotted arrow, maybe some kind of you know, retention of, um, of a, a past genre moment, which then actually changes our relationship with the older genre. Um, so the case study I'm going to come on le to later um, is about jungle and drum and bass. And what's notable there is the sheer number of different genres it pulls into its material, uh, like reggae and hip-hop and funk. Um, and part of the argument here is that when this happens, our relationship with these previous genres as aesthetic objects changes. Um, so not only are individual genres uh, motile, but sort of genre complexes are motile as well. Furthermore, this is all uh, perspectival. Um, so our ex people's experiences of these networks of networks um, might be different, which isn't to say that it's just a kind of weird relativistic field where anything might be true, um, but that there's interpretive work that goes on in encountering these networks of relationships, and how that gets articulated is partly a matter of who's talking to whom and when. Um, and if we're going to try and make sense of how these networks are formed by going through discourse um, or doing interviews, then we need to pay attention um, to how these kind of perspectival um, matters obtain in a particular case. There you go. I said it would be a quick <coughs> uh, whistle-stop tour. So to remind you, 
Um, what we're going for is to somehow take this rich theory of genre that Georgina and David in particular have, um, have developed and uh, the sort of what's going on in music informatics, whatever it is that's going on in informa music informatics, and see how some smooshing uh, can occur in a constructive way, um, and how music informatics might, if it were in the mood, orientate itself to, towards more a relationship with exchange, of exchange with um, music studies, and make contributions to theory, which thus far it hasn't really done. So, the kind of strain that I'm going to investigate um, for, for this project uh, with a little case study is to move away from the kind of machine learning as black box prediction pipeline that I showed at the beginning and to engage with emerging work around um, causal inference, which has been getting a lot of traction in evolutionary anthropology and cultural evolution, but also parts of biology and, um, and ecology, um, which is still a form of machine learning. Um, it doesn't feel quite so much like machine learning because it doesn't feel as magical, um, but it has some ways of working through these shortcomings of, um, of sort of orthodox machine learning, which I think are quite useful for the kind of interdisciplinarity that we want to pursue. Um, so we want something that's exploratory, explanatory rather than exploratory. We want something that's interpretable rather than opaque. We want something that isn't actually too arcane to get started on because where the wheels so often can fall off with interdisciplinarity work, in, interdisciplinary work is that um, actually, you know, you start having an idea and tossing something around and then the, the engineer, for example, has to go off and do three days of really technical, hard to explain work on a mysterious system and come back with an answer. And actually you want some kind of setting where you can start to develop um, different shared views um, of, the, of the object of study before stuff gets too technical and, and too gnarly and too lost in the weeds. Um, and we also want something that can deal with the obvious data challenges that you're going to get if you start to try to do this stuff in the wild. You've got qualitative data with limited quantity of di in diverse places. It's changing over time. It's probably noisy and almost certainly incomplete, all of which are quite hard to deal with um, in, a, in a neural network setting. Um, and also, I think for a given genre complex, given what I've showed you with all these changing networks, you're not even sure at the outset what it is that you want to measure. So there needs to be some some part of the process that's deliberative where you can work out what it is out in the world that you can observe that might start to tell you something useful about what it is that you're thinking through. So the, the sort of workflow for causal inference isn't all that different, except that you're starting out from theory all the time. Um, and you, you build up from an explicitly stated theory um, <coughs> um, which means that you're interpretable by default. You're hand building um, a statistical model where you've actually specified interaction by interaction what you think affects what, which means that there's always a kind of backward link where you can say, okay, I'm doing this thing because I believe X affects Y, rather than getting to the end of your experiment and having to do some pretty abstruse stuff to look inside the trained neural network and think, well, what does this think it's learned about the patterns in the, in the data? Um, and really, what's important here is that it's partly a tool for theoretical revision as well as um, empirical validation. So I've kind of drawn in all these possible lines where you can go back and start changing your mind on the basis first of having done some simulation against what you think might ideally be true. Um, but then if you actually get out into the field and discover that your theory is completely wrong, um, then that's an invitation to go back and revise the thing. Um, and because you actually made some explicit commitments at the beginning in public about what you think the theory is, um, then it leads to a different kind of conversation. Rather than kind of pouring over these opaque black boxes, you get to have a discussion about what you actually think is going on in the world um, at a theoretical level, which I think has greater promise for an interdisciplinary conversation. 
So we're going to be quite conventional um, as far as this kind of work is concerned and sort of limit ourselves in the first instance really just to developing this, this simulation stage um, because this first box on the bottom, what data is actually available, is regarded by people in this, um, in this field as being really important yet really neglected. So sitting down and considering the relationship between what you would ideally like to measure, let's say we can meet, read, the, the, read the minds of musicians 30 years ago and discover what it is that they were trying to do by magic. But of course we can't, so when you go out into the field um, and do some interview work or some archival work, actually sitting down and being really slow and again explicit about what that does to your, um, to your procedure, again, makes for both better science and better interdisciplinarity. So yeah, this is sort of summing up my, my rationale for why um, doing this kind of simulation study um, from, for machine learning as uh, a social science engineering collaboration has got something uh, to be said for it. Um, focus on explanation, um, a way of actually thinking through measurement issues, more explainable, uh, pathways to revision, um, and this idea that's coming out of current meta-science discussions, so this paper here by um, Bernard de Visa, is the idea that actually science, particularly psychology, but um, as we've, uh, music genre recognition as well, is slightly plagued by result centricity at the moment. As long as everyone is pumping out papers against benchmarks, then there isn't enough theoretical development um, going on, and we're not actually improving our, um, our understanding of, of the domain under study. So, nearly at the end. Um, what we're applying this to is a couple of case studies, and we're sort of part way through the first one, which is to look at jungle and drum and bass in the early 90s as, as an emerging genre. Um, and it's really, I mean, it's really interesting anyway because I love it. Um, but I think it's quite important because a lot of this sort of genre action in '90s dance music is actually pretty underinvestigated, but also tremendously rich. There was a lot of stuff that happened in the '90s really quite quickly, um, and jungle in particular was very musically distinctive and appeared quite suddenly. And a lot of things changed about it quite quickly, like in the period of a few years. Um, and it brings up some important questions for, for the genre theory that I presented before. There's a perspectival question, like this issue of the jungle versus drum and bass um, nomenclature. So if anyone what saw that university challenge clip that was doing the rounds a couple of weeks ago, there was a question on the university challenge um, to which the correct answer turned out to be jungle and not drum and bass. Um, but actually finding out what this distinction turns on for different people is, um, is not a simple matter. Um, there's really rich questions of social identity. I mean, jungle was the first black British electronic music um, and its, its gentrification sort of since the late 90s and a pushback against that um, has sort of hinged to a large extent on the extent to which the contribution of um, black working class people in particular has been kind of erased from a lot of this history. Um, and its emergence has some really interesting features um, that sort of help us think through um, how genres might behave in new and interesting ways. Um, so yeah, some of these sort of examples of this perspectivalism question. Um, on the right here, sort of the subtitles of two sort of popular history books about the genre. And this sort of, they've got this awkward compound of jungle slash drum and bass, and this turns out to be quite common now, that people don't want to commit themselves one way or the other. So you get this like, weird um, uh, thing. Um, here's a review from KMAG, which is kind of one of the specialized drum and bass um, magazines from 2010. And look, someone purportedly an expert just shrugging their shoulders and saying they wouldn't know how to explain the difference. Um, and then uh, one of the top producers, Rob Playford, um, apparently saying that, you know, he'll only use the word jungle for people in the know. Um, and then with, you know, <coughs> uh, 
for just sort of Johnny Nobody to say drum, drum and bass um, as a kind of safe, safe term. Um, and sort of in the present, it sort of, there seems to be kind of three different ways of understanding this distinction. It's sort of, for some people, it's purely stylistic. For other people, it's a signifier of this gentrification process that took place. And for a kind of third category, there really isn't a difference. They're just synonymous. You can, you can use either for the whole, uh, for the whole nexus. Um, and tracing when and how it was that drum and bass became a term of art is quite interesting because um, sort of try and work out who did it and why. Um, and it partly comes in a response to um, the way that the genre was very quickly racialized in the media um, when, it when it first appeared. Um, and <coughs> in, in unflattering terms. Um, so the first strain of jungle um, that becomes commercially very successful was a, a subgenre called Ragga Jungle, um, which has got very strong ties with, uh, with Jamaican dancehall, and you've generally got MCs over the top. Um, and there's a kind of media panic, um, sort of first tying the name jungle to this genre, but then making outlandish sort of associations with how much it was plagued by criminality and crack usage and what have you which were never really demonstrated to be any more acute than in, in any other part of um, dance music. But it had quite long-lasting effects on the genre, um, insofar as promoters then kind of latched onto drum and bass as a, a tactical rebranding to try and sort of make it seem safer. Um, but drum and bass itself never really attaches itself unambiguously to a particular sound, uh, which is partly why we have this, this awkward relationship um, and it doesn't ever universally become the name uh, for, for the whole nexus. Um, so it's always unsettled. Um, <coughs> you can tell me I'm wrong about this, uh, but there's kind of a, a possible map to help kind of navigate um, the, the next few slides of how some of the branchings happen of, of um, different stylistic varieties. So we have this kind of early branch with Ragga Jungle, and that's like quite quickly followed by what Simon Reynolds uh, dubbed art core, and that kind of stuck uh, within the scene, but um, that's partly a sort of sty stylistic um, shift away from the kind of crowd-pleasing jump-up um, in intense stuff towards a slightly sort of mellower uh, strain, and that then kind of splits in two, so um, Metalheads Reinforced isn't a subgenre, it's two labels, but I've put them on there because they're actually quite important for holding the whole thing together. What happened with this split that I'm calling Intelligent, which is sort of represented by artists like AT, uh, LTJ Bookham and, and Adam F, is that they really, they kept softening it up and it sounded more and more kind of almost like lounge music. Um, and they were very hostile um, particularly to Ragga Jungle, but also to the idea that um, this was just party music. They wanted to be taken much more seriously um, as, as sort of thinking avant-garde musicians. And then at the end here, we have this, um, this moment called Tech Step, which is very significant, partly because it was a reaction against um, the intelligent drum and bass moment, but it's also the moment where black audiences depart. Um, and there's a major shift in the scene at this point. Um, so yeah, two possible ways that the stylistic perspective is carved up is one that jungle just comes before, um, or that we can make a sign of um, sort of more laminal uh, division like that, where all this art core stuff is the drum and bass flavour, and all this um, sort of ragger and harder stuff is the jungle flavour. Neither of which we're in a position to arbitrate on. It's just kind of you know um, different beliefs that people attach themselves to. Um, how am I doing for time? Seven pass. Right. Okay. Let's speed up a little bit. Um, <coughs> the questions of race are really important and really sensitive, but also really interesting. Um, partly because, for all that it seems like, um, when the art core and the intelligent stuff and that slide will we'll come back in a minute and I can show you what, what I'm talking about was jettisoning some of its references to black music. What's actually going on is that there was a long-running 
um, kind of source of distinction um, in um, between US black musics like hip hop and funk and soul um, and Jama Jamaican musics. And this was already a pre existing aesthetic distinction um, sort of among sort of black communities in London. Like um, sound systems were very suspicious of hip hop because it was too American. Um, you might go to separate places for funk and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and Casper Melville writes really, really well about all this sort of thing. Um, and the way that a lot of these race connotations get reinforced in the genre um, is kind of down to sort of some of the institutional actors at every level. So it's partly the, the state um, and the police start mm -hmm. sort of responding to this racial panic that gets cooked up around Ragga Jungle um, and start actually stopping events that call themselves uh, Jungle being held. Um, but also that broadcasters at various levels are initially quite hostile and resistant, particularly the BBC, until there's been this sort of uh, safe rebranding. So the BBC is actually quite late to, to pick up on it. Um, and then eventually, um, quite quickly actually, the scene gets sort of sucked up first into a sort of major label success. So Goldie's Timeless comes out in 1995 and sells an absurd number of copies. It's kind of this massive breakout record. Um, but the thing, it never becomes a truly major label phenomenon. It sinks back down into club land quite quickly. But by this point, it's part of the super clubs, the institutionalized, um, very commercial club land, so it's like Ministry of Sound and Cream and what have you, not, not a warehouse in Tottenham um, anymore. So um, at that point, you start to see kind of social trans transformation of like it becomes harder for working class audiences to afford example to, to go to these things um, so yeah a quick view of what I'm talking about here these all these sort of little sub these genre names underneath the subgenres are to do with retention so like what what these styles are holding on to from from past formations of music and again I've tried to sort of indicate with some little icons what that relationship is um, so we see that um, for example um, the art core branch um, completely tries to get rid of any hint of dance hall. And that's how it distinguishes itself and starts experimenting instead with sort of ambient textures and, and what have you. And then sort of coming along with this, this top part here, um, Jamaican references in general start to diminish and you start to get many more hip hop samples in, instead of sort of representing um, a sort of different relationship to black diasporic music. Um, and then finally, uh, yeah, some interesting things to say about genre revolution because it doesn't really follow a pattern of something that emerges, consolidates, and then f fades away again. Um, in so far as once it's become established in clubland, it's just been on a kind of 30-year cycle of, of not doing very much except occasionally referring back to, to earlier sort of, uh, movements. And there was never a clear style that won. Um, as we see, kind of all those branchings, like just in that three-year period, there's a lot going on in terms of like subgenres appearing and disappearing, and that's not even all of them. That's just kind of selected highlights, and you get this very accelerated cycle, um, which I think you probably see in other dance musics as well, but it, particularly in jungle because they've inherited the practice of dub plates, so getting sort of acetates pressed up. Uh, for limited usage for DJs, a very accelerated cycle of reception and, and iteration that comes through on the dance floors. Um, and so, yeah, from these three points at the end here, these kind of continue almost as sort of semi-independent strains for the next sort of 30 years or so. So uh, jump, jump up um, and tech step becomes this thing called dark and this sort of becomes a thing called liquid. And you get different nights for these things, but they're all drum and bass, but di different flavors and nothing ever really dominates uh, from that point on. So the ne next steps, having gone through this reading, um, is to actually start to try and pull out some stuff to model. Um, and the sort of process here will be to sort of pick up on some of the sort of interactions that I've really whizzed over here and use these things called directed acyclic network graphs, sorry, directed acyclic graphs, gra DAGs, which I'll show you one on the next slide, um, to start thinking about like, what's affecting what um, and you know, what other things might be at play. 
And the reason I think these are quite valuable, I spoke earlier about problems with arcane stuff in, in machine learning, is that there's virtually no arcana involved in making one of these. So, you know, everyone can sit down and sketch one of these things out. What you then do with them becomes a little bit more arcane because there's some quite cle clever stuff you can do with these networks to then reason about what it is that you can model. But as a first step to actually agreeing on what might be interacting, I think it's, it's really valuable. Um, and then we can start to think about whether or not, you know, this sheds any light on the sort of existing theories of, uh, of the genre's evolution. Um, and finally, like, if one were to start testing these theories out, out in the world, like, would you need new MRI techniques? What kind of archival research would be called for? Um, and, and so forth. Um, so just for an example, if we were to, sorry, at the bottom here, if we were to approach this as sort of an agent-based model around the sort of question of the race sonic um, connotations and the composition of the audience, so it, is there a possible hypothesis that the change in the way that musical genres of the past were represented in genre caused the black audience to, um, to leave in around 1996-97, which is certainly one of the theoretical claims that's made, how would you go about kind of modelling that? And this is one of these little DAGs here. So we've got M sub R, sort of music sub race, um, is going to have an effect on the listener, but it's also going to be me mediated by discourse, right? So this is the simplest possible model that one can make in a station waiting room on the way to Manchester. Um, and, of course, um, what makes um, modelling so much fun is that both the listener and the discursive mediations are actually going to be co-affected by all kinds of unobserved and unobservable confounds. And this is where the modelling becomes difficult um, because it means, for example, um, that one is no longer able to make firm statistical claims about the relation of M sub R to L, um, but you have to do some more um, involved stuff to start thinking about, well... Um, how catastrophic would that effect be? But importantly, I think, for the kind of synergies that we're trying to um, develop here, it means that you will, this is the point where you need a combination of the qualitative and the quantitative. If, you, if you've got to the point where you know that you can't actually make a statistical claim about a relationship about because you can't measure stuff, that's where you have to combine qualitative testimony, i.e. interview studies of how, how these musical changes affected people, with whatever limited modeling you can do. I think following that through in a detailed and principled way, the hope is, will set out kind of a possible methodological template um, for collaborations between the social sciences and music informatics. I'm gonna stop now.
Somebody that you killed uh, nine years ago tried to go see what was the picture of a great big dancer um, in Jersey Shack. And, and it was a great day. It was a really great day. Um, and that's hard. You know, it's just it's cool.
the lure of the run, so he, he's got to be nice to the rest of that fire. And then for us, Mr. Story, I'm just to serve. Make it just speak to a modern girl. Can you estimate um, distribution and disconnection? So you, you treat the whole network. Well, yeah, I had a bunch of tabs open, I completely forgot. <laughs> All really good examples. Uh, this, 